Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our healing school. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, a warm welcome also to those of you who are watching us uh, online via live stream. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Andrew Womack Ministries Canada and Caris Bible College uh, Toronto, thank you all for being part of this healing school. And uh, God is good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Isn't he? He is. Yeah. Amen. So expect to receive from him tonight. Uh, but before we uh, go into worship, we have to take care of some uh, technicalities. So first of all, in case of an emergency, if, the, if we ever hear the fire alarm uh, go off, uh, we have an exit right there to my left. And we also have the front door by which you came in. And there's also another door all the way at the end of the uh, long corridor. So uh, we can use uh, these exit if, uh, in case of an emergency. And also, if you need to use the washroom, when we exit this, um, uh, this room, <laughs> to your left, at the right, on the, uh, to your left, at, to your left, on the right, <laughs> on the, your right, uh, at the right hand of the corridor, you will, found, uh, you will find uh, the ladies' room and the men's room. Um, there's also a washroom for um, a disabled uh, person. So it's in the, uh, the long corridor. It's on the left-hand side. Um, later on, at the end of the teaching, are our trained and spirit-filled prayer ministers uh, they all are uh, Karis Bible uh, students, uh, past or present, and they will be available to, for you to come and receive prayer for them. So it, it's, uh, it's going to be at the end of our teaching. So um, they will pray with you, they will agree with you, and they will minister the word of God to you. So expect to receive from God again. And since we are not uh, accredited medical doctors, and we are not also uh, recognized uh, counselors. Uh, we ask you to fill out this form. It's called a prayer minister outreach disclaimer before going to receive prayer. So if you have not filled this out uh, already, we encourage you to do it right now and to um, give your filled out copy at um, the front. Uh, smiling lady, Erin. Erin, can you wave for us? Thank you. So the praise reports are over there. And when you fill them out, we, we ask you to give it back to Aaron. Also, I, I need to tell you, um, um, since uh, the healing school is being recorded and broadcast uh, online via live stream, we also ask you to fill out this form called media release. It's a form like this that you can find also uh, where... Um, Erin is. So we ask you to fill it out. And uh, once it's filled out, you can give it back to Erin also. Uh, so also, after you have received from the Lord, not if, but when you receive from the Amen. Lord, we ask you to fill out, if you want, a praise report telling us how God ministered to you. Um, if you have received healing or if you have received another manifestation of the, uh, the Holy Spirit or the power of God in you. So thank you for completing it and leaving it. Uh, you can uh, find the form also where Erin is, and to, you can give it back to her also if you, if you want to. So um, this is what this evening is all about. It's about receiving from God. And uh, receiving what Jesus has already accomplished for us at the cross. Amen? So, um, also, I have to tell you that uh, for those of you who want to make a contribution, you have some envelopes on the seats, and there's um, a donation bucket all the, at the end also. And finally, I want to tell you that uh, our next healing school would be uh, Monday, January 8th at uh, 7 p.m. So that's next year, which is in three weeks. <laughs> is it four, uh, four weeks? Three weeks? Okay. So, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your attention, and now let's uh, worship our Lord, uh, and let's welcome Mrs. Abby Alshaw and her husband John, and uh, they're, they're direct, the directors here at Caris Bible College, and um, Rachel, and let's worship our Lord. Amen.
Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we have time to worship God despite the snow outside. We are going to be blessed tonight. I know that, that God, you know, we come with an expectation. God is faithful to, to show up, to do stuff, and to bless us. He's an amazing God. So um, tonight you can worship any way you like. You can stand, you can sit, you can lie on the floor if you want to, as long as you don't trip anyone else up. Seated above
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one you could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever bring, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one you could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Surely there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
Well, today is our fourth healing school that we've had. First one was in September. And we wanted to encourage you by some of the reports we've received that have encouraged us. So I have about a half a dozen to share with you today. And I hope they'll bless you as much as they have us. There was one woman, and as she was being prayed for, she felt a warmth flow through her body she felt pain and inflammation receding and diminishing. And she said she feels free in her body for the first time in nine months. Woo! Mm. There um, was another person who received healing in their left ear and yet another who had very poor hearing and it was restored. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. There's yet another lady who uh, had been experiencing stomach pain 
as a result of a period of intense stress. And after an encounter with the Lord, her pain left, and it has not returned as she studies the word and listens to Andrew's teaching. Uh, there's a man from another province, and he'd asked us for, to pray for him, and in this case, the staff were praying for him. And um, he was diagnosed with lymphoma, and it's a cancer that was in his bones, and he also had a large tumor on his neck. Um, he had not received any medical treatment for the uh, cancer in his bones, and the last time he went to the physician, he was told that it's inactive. There's no cancer working in his bones. Yeah. He was told he should have massive doses of radiation on his neck, and he said, uh, after prayer, he said, you know, give me a little, but not, I don't want what I've heard, you know, bad stories of, of a lot of it, just a little bit. The doctor said, well, you're not going to see much difference, and he and his wife reported they'd seen a huge difference. Praise God. And the last one I'll share with you is there was a lady who came up for prayer, and she had had excruciating back pain on every movement for 10 years. She said she'd received healing in many other areas, but for some reason this was not going. After we prayed for her, it was evident she had more movement and less weakness. That night she slept well. The next morning, after 10 years, she awoke with no pain. Woo! And she said she's been able to walk straight after that. Praise so God. praise God, he's Hallelujah. good. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Well, hello, hello. I hope you guys came expecting because great things have already happened because Jesus has already done it. And tonight is my great pleasure to introduce a, a wonderful man. He is the executive director of Canada. He is our mentor. He is an awesome teacher of the word. And he's somebody who has lived it. And he's going to bring you on a journey tonight. But I want you to strap your seatbelts in and let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Scott Kennedy. Thanks. Well, thank you, Marilla. Is that loud enough there? Good. Sharon, give me the thumbs up or the thumbs down if it doesn't. It's wonderful to be here tonight. It's, uh, the weather didn't uh, do us any favors, but you know what? You folks all came out, and you're expecting something from the Lord. And the Lord never disappoints, amen? amen. He never disappoints. So if I was going to give a title to my message tonight, I'd call it the Twin Blessings. And you'll see in a little while why I'm going to describe it as the twin blessings. But I want to start off with a show of hands. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you to give a show of hands. I want you to listen carefully to what I'm saying. And when I give you the cue, please give me the show of hands. Don't answer yet. How many here would identify as being born-again Christians? First question. How many of you here know that Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sins. Absolutely. Every sin. Past, present, and future. How many of you know that beyond a shadow of a doubt and no one could persuade you to the contrary? And now you can do the show of hands. That's a pretty good show of hands. Pretty good show of hands. Now, I'm going to ask you why that would be. Why you could put up your hands with that confidence when I'm saying you, you know this with absolute certainty. Nobody could persuade you to the contrary. And I'm going to suggest to you it's two things. One is because the Word of God tells you that. So we know some of those scriptures, but I'm going to give you just two of them. 
One is where John comes along and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then another scripture says, He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might be the righteousness of God in him. You see, we look at scriptures like that and we say, I'm rock certain, I'm dead certain that my Jesus took my sins, every last one of them, nothing left out. And there's a second reason why you put your hands up. And that is because not only does his word say that, but you've come to know him. Amen? Amen. You've come to know a personal God and Savior. And you know that you can believe him because you have come to know him personally. And let me ask you this question. When those sins were taken from you, every last one of them, when did that happen and where did that happen? Come on now. Come on now. Louder. It happened on the cross. It happened over 2,000 years ago. It happened before you were even born or even thought of, except in the mind of God. Now, I'm going to ask you to give a show of hands in a minute again. Just, just hold off till I tell you. And I want you to be honest about this question that I'm going to ask you. I don't want you to be spiritually correct. You know what spiritually correct is, right? If we can be politically correct, you know, we say the right things because we expect that's what we should say because people want us to say those things. But we can also sometimes be spiritually correct where we say the thing that we expect our brothers and sisters around us expect us to say. But I want you to not be spiritually correct. I'll, I'll tell you when to put your hands up. How many of you know that every sickness and every disease that you have ever had or that you have now, right here in this room, have been healed and taken away? Every disease present, every disease future, the ones you have now, if you have any, that you've been healed and that you are healed and that you're as absolutely certain of that as you are that your sins have been taken away. Now you can raise your hands. Okay. There were a lot of hands the first time. There were a little less the second time. And that is as I would have expected it. How many of you here were here on October the 30th? Uh, I spoke at healing school on October 30th as well. How many of you were, were here or would admit to it even? Yeah, some of you were. Uh, I'm not going to test you to see if you knew and remember what I was talking about because um, I don't want you to hurt my feelings. <laughs> but what I spoke about was three keys to receiving healing. And the first key to receiving healing was that you have a clear understanding that Satan is the source of all sickness and disease as surely he, as he is the source of all sins and iniquity. Amen? Do I get an amen over that? Yeah. The second was that it's critical that you have a clear understanding that God hates sickness and disease every bit as much as he hates sin and iniquity. Critical to have that. And the third thing is that it is critical that you have a revelation in your heart of those two things. Not just that we know it in our head, not that we have a knowledge of it and an understanding of it that we could repeat the scriptural verses that tell us about that, but that we have a revelation in our heart itself. Three key things. So I wanna say this to you, it may sound a little challenging, but if we don't fully believe what God says in his word about our healing, we have no reason to fully believe what he says in his word about the forgiveness of our sins. Amen? Amen? If we don't believe as firmly that he took our sicknesses and diseases on the cross as he took our sins and iniquities, we don't really believe either. Now, I'm messing with you a bit here, but it's, it's correct what I'm saying. And here's the reason, is because you see it's the same God and it's the same Bible that tells us both things. If we believe one, we've got to believe the other. If we don't believe one, we're really not believing either. 
Amen? Now, I'm not saying this to make you feel in any way insecure or doubt your salvation and the forgiveness of your sins or the healing of your sicknesses and diseases. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. The reason I'm saying this is because I want you to leave this place tonight with a rock-solid confidence like you have never had before that God is every bit as much a healer of your sicknesses and diseases, everything that you might have now or everything that you would ever have between now and the end of your life before you shoot out of here and go to heaven as he is the forgiver of your sins and iniquities. And I'm confident that I'm going to convince you of that if you have the slightest doubt. Here's the good news, brothers and sisters. The good news is that the scriptures clearly show that God has healed our sicknesses and diseases just as much as he's forgiven our sins. And to show you that, I want to show you a series of scriptures. You're going to find them very familiar. You may say, yeah, I've, I've seen those before. I've heard those before. But I want you to look at these scriptures as though you were looking at them for the first time. I'm going to give you a number of scriptures. Is that okay? Yes. Can you bear it? Yes. All right. You should be able to. Because the scriptures say, my son, attend to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart because they are what? Life to those who find them and health to their whole body. So you can take it. Let me start you with a scripture that I call the healing is God's idea scripture. I want to have you turn, if you would, please, to Exodus. We're going to get right close to the start of the Bible. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. And here's what the Lord says. The Lord said, speaking to Israel, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, and give ear to His commandments, and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments, and keep all His statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Those words, the Lord your healer, in the Hebrew are Jehovah Rapha. They are the second of these fundamental seven words of revelation that God gives about himself, these foundational names. And here's what Rapha means. Jehovah, we know, means God. Here's what Rapha means. It means to mend by stitching, to cure, to cause to heal. It means physician. It means to repair and make whole. So you see, when he is saying to you, I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord your healer, he is saying, basically, I am your personal physician. Do we believe that? Yeah, yeah we do. We want to believe that. Because this is where we get the expression about our Lord, that he is the great physician. This is the very scripture that this comes from. This is God, brothers and sisters, coming to us early in his word and saying, I want to tell you who I am. I don't want you coming to me and saying, I want you to be this. I'm coming to you to tell you that that's who I am already. And you see, for us, what he's trying to do is to get us up to speed with him, what he's already told us about himself, what he's already revealed. We're not trying to persuade him of anything any more than we're trying to persuade him to be the forgiver of our sins. The great physician. Healing's God's idea. So I want to show you some scriptures now, and I'm going to show you a whole series of them where God in his word speaks about sickness and disease and sin and iniquity in exactly the same scripture, in exactly the same way. And there's a reason for that. Because these two things both come from the same source. They both come from the enemy. They both come from the one who brought stuff into this world that was completely contrary to the will of our Father. Can I get an amen? Good stuff. All right, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. We're still in Exodus. You know the context of this. This is the people of Israel 
who are being led out of Egypt by the Father after having been oppressed for many years. And so let's pick it up at verse 7, and we'll go through to verse 10. And here's the instructions of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the instructions of our Father. Just as the destroying angel was about to come into Egypt, here's what the Lord says. Starting verse 7. Moreover, after having killed the lamb, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled. Listen to this part. I'm going to talk to you about this in a minute. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until the morning, but whatever is left till the morning, you shall burn with fire. So how come the blood? Why are they taking the blood and putting it on the lintels of their houses, the posts? You see, because the blood was the thing that the Lord set out as the antidote to sin. When they put it on the pillars of their houses, on the doorposts of their houses, when that destroying angel came through, those who had enough faith and believed the word of the Lord to do that in obedience, what happened? Totally protected. Those who didn't, whether they were Israelites or whether they were Egyptians, were killed. And it's interesting, it's not because the Jews who did this were without sin. In fact, God had struggled with this people for a long time saying, you know, you're, you're not doing the things I want you to do. You're not keeping my commandments. You're not holding to my ways. But if they had enough faith to put the blood, if they had faith in the blood to put it on the doorposts of their houses, even though they themselves had fallen short, they were protected. That's a picture of you and me. This is a foreshadowing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That when we buy faith, not because we are perfect or sinless, but because we believe in what God says, when we apply the blood of Jesus to our lives by receiving Him, our sins and our iniquities are just washed away. That's the blood. So how come the lamb? Why eat the flesh of the lamb? Now think of this. There were over a million Israelites who were set free from Egypt that day. Among those million people were young children and very elderly people. And I don't want you to think that the Israelites were a real healthy bunch of robust people because they had been in slavery in Egypt for many years, 400 years. And remember, guys, the living and working conditions weren't so great. Like these weren't executive white-collar jobs these guys had. These guys were under harsh taskmasters. They were physically brutally beaten. They were taxed in their labors. And they weren't given very good food to eat. They wasn't going to be following Canada's food guide. So these were people who were being led out in this kind of condition. Do you think there might have been a few sick people among them? Yes, a few sick people among them. But they were told to eat of the flesh of the lamb who was slain. I'm going to show you what the result was. Turn, if you would, please, to Psalm 105. Psalm 105, verse 37. And here's what the Lord says. So remember now they have applied the blood to the doorposts. They have eaten the flesh of this lamb. And now they've left. They're moving out of Egypt. And here's what the Lord says in Psalm 105, verse 37. Then he brought them out with silver and gold. And listen now. Among his tribes there was not one who stumbled. Another translation says, among his tribes there was not one feeble. Old, young, people who had been sick, people who had been oppressed, not one feeble. How come? Because they ate the flesh of the lamb. So who does the lamb represent? The lamb represents Jesus. 
the blood represents the blood of Jesus. The flesh of the lamb represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he says, take, eat of my body, drink of my blood. The lamb represents the body of Jesus, broken for you and me. And you see, what the Bible is telling us early on is that when we take the benefit of the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was to occur on the cross. We know this was a foreshadowing of Jesus on the cross, that when we take advantage of and put our belief in his broken body, it is for the healing of our bodies. Do you realize, guys, this is just the second book of the Bible? This is Exodus. We've only begun. We've only begun. Do you know that the scripture says, Jesus says in the, in the book of the law and the Psalms and the prophets, it is written of me. When we go into the word of God in the Old Testament, there is more foreshadowing than we have yet seen. I want to show you another foreshadowing you may never have seen before because this is talking about the lamb. Exodus 12, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to that verse that I read a minute ago. So it says this. Exodus 12, verse 8. They shall eat the flesh that same night, listen, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire. How come? How come they couldn't eat it raw? How come they couldn't eat it boiled with water? And then it goes on to say, but rather roasted with fire both its head and its legs along with its entrails. What it's saying is the whole thing. You don't cut it up. You put the whole thing in there. What is the lamb of foreshadowing of? Our Lord Jesus Christ. It was to be burned in fire. Jesus descended into hell filled with all the sins that would ever be all the sicknesses and diseases that would ever be. He descended into the fire of hell for us. That's why that was written to the Israelites to do that, because it was a foreshadowing of Jesus going into hell. Isn't it amazing how the Word of God is, is so rich in fullness of its foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus Christ? This, brothers and sisters, just in the second book of the Bible, is a picture of the full salvation that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who forgives all our iniquities and sins, the one who heals all our diseases, all our infirmities. That's the first, the first of, of these scriptures that I want to show you. Psalm 103, please turn to Psalm 103. Familiar scripture. But listen to the picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ does. Our Heavenly Father does. Out of the mouth of David, a man after God's own heart. Let's read Psalm 103, 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Listen to that word, all. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits, who pardons all your iniquities who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. It's all followed by all, followed by all, from David the man after God's own heart. What does the word all mean? All. Oh. Can you tell me what's left out of the word all? Nothing. Nothing. So when he says that he forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases, do you think he means all? Yes. Amen. A man after God's own heart. So you see how the word of God systematically is saying, I deal with your sins and iniquities 
and I deal with your sicknesses and your diseases. Are you tracking with me? Amen. 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 Isaiah 53. Let's turn to Isaiah 53. A tremendous scripture. Tremendous scripture foreshadowing our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. This is a scripture that looks forward to what was to take place on the cross. Why don't you go to verse 4 with me, please? Surely he has borne our griefs. Let me talk to you for a moment about that word griefs. That word griefs in the original Hebrew is the word koli. And that word literally means sicknesses. If you have a, a good Bible, you will see there will be a footnote referring to the word sickness. I'm not saying you've got a bad Bible if you don't, but you know what I mean. Let's look at that again. Surely he has borne our, the word it should be translated as, literally from the Hebrew is, surely he has borne our sicknesses. And then the next one, and carried our sorrows. That word sorrows is a Hebrew word called makab. And that word makab only ever means in the Hebrew physical pain. And so those two, those two scriptures together, it should be translated this way. Surely he has borne our sickness and carried our pain. Now you may be thinking to yourself, okay, look, Scott, you're already kind of pushing it at this point. Um, you know, you're just taking a translation and you're exchanging words. I want to introduce you to Matthew. You know Matthew from the New Testament. He was a good Jewish boy. He knew a little bit about Hebrew. And so here is what Matthew says, here's what Matthew says about these very verses in Isaiah 53. Let's start Matthew 8, verse 14. When Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and waited on him. Now listen to these verses. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. You see, Matthew knew full well what that scripture read in the Hebrew. Here's our Lord Jesus Christ taking away our sickness and our pain on the cross. And these by the way, brothers and sisters, are never used as spiritual sickness. Now, there are references in Scripture to spiritual sickness, but these two words literally mean physical sicknesses and pains. So let's go on, because we're, we're seeing how our Heavenly Father deals with both sickness and iniquity. Look at, look at verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. So now we've started with the sicknesses and the pains, and now we move to the iniquities and the transgressions. And then he comes back again to the sicknesses in verse 5. And by his stripes we are healed. You see what our Lord is trying to... Do you see that the Lord is trying to get something across to you? Is that my salvation is a full package. It's a full salvation. I treat sicknesses and diseases the same way that I treat iniquities and sins because they come from the same source and I'm opposed to both of them. Can you see that? Let's look at verse 6. He comes back to iniquity. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 8 talks about transgressions of my people again. Then listen to verse 10. Here's the literal Hebrew translation. I'm going to read you first what I have here. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. The exact Hebrew rendering of he has put him to grief is he has made him sick. And that word in the Hebrew, sick, means physically sick. So our Lord is showing us in all this parallel that he deals as surely with our sicknesses and diseases as he does with our sins and iniquities. 
Let me have you turn back now to Isaiah 52, verse 14. I want to tie this all in for you so that when you come out, you have a clear conviction of what our Lord is saying in his word. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, starting in verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He will be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus was on the cross between two thieves. Those men were both crucified like him. They had both, both been beaten and badly dealt with physically just like him. And yet of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says that his body and form were marred more than any man. How come? Why would it be more so than the two thieves, one on either side? They went through the same process, didn't they? Well, here's the reason. Because when our Lord Jesus Christ went on the cross... Not only was he nailed to the cross, not only was he beaten beforehand, but when he was on that cross, his body took on and into itself every sickness, every disease that had ever been experienced or ever would be by any human being and every sin and every iniquity that had ever been in any human being. We have enough challenge struggling with our own shortcomings and our own iniquities but he got it all. And that's why the writer of Isaiah says that his form and his visage were marred more than any man because he was carrying all that. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Philippians 2, verse 7. Let's, let's start with verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Listen to those words, brothers and sisters. Emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. You see, he was part of the Godhead with the Father, part of the fullness of God. But then he emptied himself. Why did he empty himself? He emptied himself because he would soon be filled with something. If he had the fullness of God in him, the fullness of God in him would not permit what he was soon to be filled with to come into him. And so he had to be emptied of that fullness so that he could be filled with those things that he took on him for us. You see why the Lord Jesus Christ emptied himself? To take on everything that came from the world. Sin and inequity, sickness and disease, the whole package. See, as I'm saying this tonight, I want to encourage you to get it locked laser sharply into your hearts. How much the Lord Jesus Christ has desired to take away sickness and disease from among us. It's one of the key reasons he went to the cross. He wanted to take those things upon him so that you and I would not have to have them. I want you to think about it in this way because it's accurate. It's correct. He took those things, those sicknesses and diseases and those sins and iniquities as his possession they became his possession. He bought them. He paid for them. And he wanted to deal with them. The last thing he wanted was to see them on you and me. Do you see how earnestly our Lord Jesus Christ desires to have us set free not only from sins and inequities, but every sickness and every disease? He paid a big price to buy those things so that he could send them away from us. Amen? Amen. What was Jesus' main purpose in coming to earth? 
Now, we know he did a lot of things. We know in coming to earth, he preached the gospel. He taught. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He forgave sins. He taught men about the reality of God, but that was not his main purpose in coming to earth, was it? His main purpose in coming to earth was to go on that cross. That was the main focus. And it was these things that he went to the cross for. To be like a giant magnet that just drew those things to him and away from us. You see, scripture after scripture, we're being shown how the Lord views and deals with sickness and disease the same way he does sin and inequity. I'm repeating myself, but I'm doing it deliberately, folks. Because there has to be a revelation that we start to have come within us about the Lord's purpose and what he has done. We have, each one of us, fallen short of that revelation, that understanding. Let me read you something from the New King James. I give you permission to read either the New American Standard or the New King James, but nothing else. Here's how the New King James... Isaiah 53 starts. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then it goes on in the rest of Isaiah 53 and telling us these stupendous, tremendous, beyond our understanding things that the Lord Jesus Christ would do on the cross. And so he's saying, here's our report. On the cross, he'll take your sicknesses and diseases. On the cross, he'll take your sins and iniquities. But who has believed our report? And then it says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It actually answers itself. The arm of the Lord is the power of the Lord, always through Scripture. The power of the Lord is revealed to those who believe the report. Amen? Amen. When we believe that report, his power can operate in our favor, and in our benefit. James chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. Please turn to James. See, we've moved from Exodus all the way through other parts of the Old Testament through now to the New Testament. And here's James chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. There's the sicknesses and diseases. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. You see, the Lord's dealing with sicknesses and diseases, sins and iniquities all the time. You see, Scripture after Scripture where they are paralleled exactly together. God's trying to get something over to us. 1 Peter 2.24. Turn there if you would. Familiar Scripture. And He Himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we may die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. Sins and iniquities and then sicknesses. Let me just kind of drop something into you here. That, uh, that word sick or sickness and then that word healed. The word healed is the Greek word aeomai. I'm probably mangling the pronunciation. But here's what it means. It means to cure, to heal, to make whole physically. By his stripes, you were healed. You see how the writer Isaiah looks forward to the cross some 700 years ahead of of him. But now Peter looks back on the cross, and so he uses the past tense. By whose stripes you were healed. God looks forward to it, and then he looks back on it. Let me turn you to another scripture. I'm coming to the end of my scriptures, 
But I want you to turn, if you would, to Malachi. I'm reading you Malachi chapter 4, verse 2 in the New King James. But to you, now listen, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. This is quite significant. The last book of the Old Testament. We're now about to turn the page and go to the New Testament. We're about to come now into the walk and the purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ. Malachi looks to this. Last book of the Old Testament. And here's what Malachi says. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Do you know that God, when he had Malachi write this, could have said a number of things. He could have said, the son of righteousness will rise with forgiveness in his wings. The son of righteousness will rise with love in his wings. The son of righteousness will rise with righteousness in his wings. But he didn't say that. He said the son of righteousness, when he will rise, what is he rising from? This is the resurrection, brothers and sisters. When the son of righteousness rises, he rises with healing in his wings. He has healing for us. Isn't that something? Do you think that healing is on God's mind a lot? The very word he chose that would be what characterized the Son of God rising from the dead, healing in his wings. You see, I want your brothers and sisters to have as much confidence for you here if you're dealing with any physical ailments or for others in your family who are dealing with physical ailments or friends. I want you to have as much confidence in the forgiveness of your sins Sorry, let me turn that around. The healing of your bodies, the healing of you from sickness as you do the forgiveness of your sins. See, God's trying to get this across to us. We need a revelation of the truth of these scriptures. I said that a little while ago. We need to come to the point where in our hearts there is such a revelation of the truth of this that we know that we know that we know that we know that we have been healed as surely as we know that we know that we know that we've been forgiven. Amen? Amen. We need to come to that point. And it's revelation that does that. For healing, here's what revelation means. It means seeing yourself on the other side of the problem. It means that when you see yourself, if you are dealing with a physical ailment, because of what the Lord has told us and what he has done on the cross, you see yourself on the other side of your problem with that problem resolved. That's what revelation for healing means for you. This isn't mind over matter. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's the power of thinking with the mind of Christ. Here's the situation. When you're dealing with a physical ailment, this side of the problem means that the problem is between you and the cross. And when you're looking towards the cross, you're seeing the problem. When you see yourself on the other side of the problem, it means the cross is between you and the problem. Amen? Can I say that again? When you see yourself on this side of the problem, your problem is between you and the cross. But when you see yourself in the spirit by revelation on the other side of the problem, as you look back on the problem, you are looking at the cross. And that's how God is wanting us to do that. I'm going to show you how the Lord Jesus himself has applied that truth. If you look at Mark 11, 22 to 24, you'll see the Lord applied this in that scripture. Mark 11, 22 to 24. You remember that scripture and that circumstance? That's where Jesus spoke to the fig tree. He cursed the fig tree. And they came by in the morning again, and Peter looks at it and says, Master, the fig tree you cursed is is dead. It wasn't dead when they went to the town in the evening, but it was in the morning. And here's what Jesus said, famous words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dealing with seeing things from the other side of the problem. 
Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. And then listen to what he says. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and it will be granted you. When you have a mountain in your life and you are praying, at the time you're praying, that mountain is still there. But when you believe that you have received what you have just prayed for, you are looking back at the problem through the cross. Our Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that. And the interesting thing is that he doesn't say, you know, for some things that you pray or for serious things for which you pray, believe that you receive them. He says, And whenever you pray, in other words, he's saying, whatever you pray for, this is the way you pray for it. You see the problem from the other side through the cross. Amen? Amen. This is getting a revelation of what the Lord has done. When we are dealing with and struggling with physical things, we're saying, but you know what? It's already dealt with on the cross. Just like if I struggle with any area in my life and a shortcoming or a sin, but you know what? That's already dealt with on the cross. See, Jesus took the sins on the cross. It doesn't mean that we sometimes don't stumble, but those sins were still taken. Sometimes we run into physical problems and ailments, but the fact that we do doesn't mean that they weren't taken on the cross. They were. We need to have a revelation Of that, we see ourselves on the other side of the problem. Let me just share something with you that I might. If you got a moment for a testimony, all right. I want to illustrate how that operated in my own life. Back in November of 2013, before I ever knew I would be coming to Karis Bible College, before I ever knew there was a Karis Bible College or an Andrew Womack or anything related to that. I was minding my own business back in Winnipeg practicing as a lawyer. And I went to uh, the physician to have something checked out. And the urologist that I saw said, you have a tumor in your prostate. Out of the blue, didn't expect that one. And he said to me, "Uh, it's certain that it's cancer. He said, but I'm going to have you take a number of tests. And then I'll have you come back in a month. And then I'll... I'll tell you for sure what it is. So I took the tests, came back a month later. He examined the tests, checked things out. He said, yeah, it's prostate cancer. That wasn't a very welcome piece of news. But what the Lord told me to do was right from that moment to immerse myself in his word and teaching on healing. And I did that from that very day for months. And so even though I was still practicing law, for the first three hours of my day, minimum, I'd get up and I would listen to teachings on healing. I would get into the Word. I remember thinking to myself at one point, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on this and less time on my law practice. And when I was saying that to the Lord, he said, Scott, this is an investment. And so I invested myself in listening to the Word several hours a day, month after month. About in the middle of March, because it was December that I got this diagnosis after the set of tests, by the middle of March of 2014, I had been pressing into the Word, no evidence of any change uh, in symptoms, doctor urging me to have a biopsy, sending literature home with me and telling me the things that I should be looking at and expecting and so forth. And about in mid-March of 2014, through a friend's casual comment, he mentioned that he had been listening to a guy called Andrew Womack in Arizona. I'd never heard of him before. I said, who's this guy? New kid on the block? He said, no, no, he's kind of an old kid on the block. Uh, he's been around for some 30 or 40 years. And I then started to listen to some of Andrew's teaching. Now, Andrew's not the main part of the story. It's what the Lord did on the cross. But Andrew was used as part of this. 
So after listening to some of Andrew's teachings along with the others for about two weeks in March, the Lord impressed it upon me strongly to find out where Andrew was teaching, get on a plane, and fly out and have him pray for me. So I did. Didn't know anything about the guy except for the little bit I had heard. He was teaching in some little place called Woodland Park in Colorado I'd never heard of. So I got on a plane, I went down, and two days after I got there, Andrew was kind of on his own between teaching classes and just kind of standing by himself. So I, I went up and I said, um, here's my situation. I've been told I have prostate cancer. The Lord has told me to come here to have you pray for me so that I'm going to be healed of this because I'm determined I'm getting healed by the Lord and I'm not going to get healed by any other way. That was my conviction. This is not a recipe for everybody. I'm not talking against doctors here. I'm just saying what the Lord told me. And so Andrew said, well, that's a good confession. He laid hands on me, prayed a short prayer, said, it's a done deal. In that voice that only Andrew has. <laughs> uh, it's a done deal. Kind of sounded like that. Um, and then he said, uh, so just follow up with us and let us know. And so I proceeded after that um, because I had a sense from the Lord to do it, to have a biopsy. They were absolutely sure that the biopsy, of course, would confirm what I'd already been told anyway. This was, just, this was just logistics. But what was interesting was this, and I want you to understand this, this area of getting a revelation of God's word that is so critical, so critical. I'd been reading the word of healing for months, but I'd been reading it for years. I had had a ministry in healing at our church, so it was something close to my heart. But in May of that year, about a month after Andrew had prayed for me, I was reading scriptures that I'd read before. Psalm 103, 1 to 5 was one of them. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Romans 8 was another one that I was reading that day. And it said, if the same spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that same spirit will quicken your mortal body. And reading those two scriptures, the Lord said to me, so Scott, who is this spirit who dwells in you? And it came down to my lightning fast mind, as Andrew's expression goes, that this is the same spirit who hovered over the universe to bring it into existence with the word of God speaking at the same time. Amen. And suddenly, revelation came. Now, folks, I knew the word prior to that time. I had prayed that word over other people. I had preached on that word for healing. And I saw people healed of all kinds of things. But that day, because the word had been building up inside of me and I had been meditating on it for months, suddenly it just exploded in revelation. And I knew that scripture, the reality of that scripture where Peter says you would do well to pay attention to the prophetic word as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. And that morning star is the star of revelation. Illumination comes, light comes, and it came for me. And in that moment, brothers and sisters, I am waiting for biopsy results. And in that moment, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that I was healed. And in that moment, it actually did not matter what the biopsy report came back and said. It literally didn't. I expected it in the natural that it was going to come back and say, yeah, absolutely, you have prostate cancer. It's just confirmed. We told you already, but this is just more of it. And when it came back, it said negative for prostate cancer. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? You see, I came to that point where when revelation came, I saw myself on the other side of the problem. And when I saw the problem, there was a big cross between me and the problem. And it took care of it. Because God had already told me in his word that the cross had taken care of the problem. I came to the point where revelation came of his word because his word had just been mainlined into me, to use that expression, until that word just built up so that there was no room for prostate cancer in my body. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Paul talks about in Ephesians, I won't go to the scripture, but he says, I pray that you would get a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the true knowledge of him 
so that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. He says, pray for a spirit of revelation. It will do incredible things with the word you already know. So let me ask you this. What if Jesus walked into this room here tonight and said, I have healed you? Would you believe it? Yes. You would believe it. Well, I want to tell you, he is in the room. Because where two or more are gathered together in his name, he is there in their midst. And he has already said, I have healed you. He has already said. So I want to call the prayer ministers up in a moment. And I want to give you an invitation. If you have something that you need healing for, this is Jesus' invitation through me to come up. Healing's his idea. I want you to be confident to come up and have prayer for whatever the issue is that you're dealing with. Believe the Lord. Receive his healing. I want to ask you one more thing. Is there anybody here who has not received the Lord Jesus Christ into their life? I'm not saying this to embarrass you. I'm just asking if there's someone here who has not received the Lord Jesus in his life yet. You see, we want to get the healing, and that's critical. But we want to get the healer, which is even more critical. When you got the healer, you got the whole package inside you. So I'm going to say this. Prayer ministers are going to be here to pray for you for healing. Expect to receive it. It's the invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer ministers are going to be here. If you have never received the Lord Jesus Christ, you can confidently and confidentially say to them, I'd like to receive this Lord Jesus Christ. They'll pray for, for you, for him right here. He also has something called the baptism in the Holy Spirit, something you receive that empowers you to be witnesses for his sake and to operate in his power. If you haven't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, come forward and receive any of the prayer ministers can pray for you to receive all of those things. So I'm going to call the prayer ministers to come forward now. And um, when they come up, whenever you're ready, you come forward for your needs and expect this Lord Jesus Christ, who we've been talking about, to meet those needs. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you, 
Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those. 